So I'd like to um, thank uh, the candidates for, for coming tonight and introduce um, Jesse Adams, um, MJ Adams, Pullen, Pullen Adams sorry, Pullen. Adams Pullen, um, Bill Dwight, and um, Jesse, and I'm sorry, um, Michael Janik. <laughs> thank you. Um, so thank you all, and we um, do have some questions um, that were already pre-formed that we'll start with. Um, actually, first, again, we'll start with giving you time to introduce yourselves. Um, two, minutes. two minutes each. Yep, we can start. Hello, my name is Jesse Adams. I'm the incumbent in this race, and I'd like to thank you all for being here, and I'd like to thank the sponsors as well. My family moved to Western Massachusetts when I was one year old. I've lived here ever since, and I've been educated locally from grammar school to law school. I live on Main Street, and I practice law on Main Street. In my day job, I fight for people's constitutional rights as well as their civil rights. My father has had a business on Main Street for 30 years as well. I've held public office for the last four years as a Forbes Library trustee, and when I was running four years ago, the first stop that I made to collect nomination signatures was at Hampshire Heights because I wanted to hear from people about the library but also their issues as well. So I'm very familiar with this area. In my first term, I served on six committees, chairing two and vice chairing two more. When I was running, I made certain promises to you and I delivered on these promises by supporting the arts and culture with fresh ideas like Jazz Fest, working towards better government through transparency and reform, carefully scrutinizing our budget to ensure that our spending matches our values and priorities, listening to all points of view and encouraging spirited and respectful discussions, and advocating for affordable housing. Public office for me is about being a voice for others, some of whom may not have a voice. Tonight I'm here to talk about my experience, values, and vision. And I'd like to ask you tonight for one of your two votes for Councilor at Large. Thank you. Hi, I'm MJ Adams Pullen. Some people might know me by MJ Adams, especially in this community. Other people in this community at Jackson Street might also know me as Mary John Pullen. Uh, but I do go by MJ Adams Pullen. Uh, and I am uh, a, a person who grew up here in Northampton, uh, attended Northampton Public Schools, graduated in the mid 70s. I uh, went off to UMass for a couple of years to decide what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, ended up wandering back into the Boston area for a while and then came back here when it was time to raise my kids. So we returned to Northampton about 15 years ago. And uh, as just as my oldest was uh, about to enter kindergarten here at Jackson Street School. And it was always my goal that um, from the time my oldest started school to the time my youngest graduated from high school, that we would be in the same community. And so far, we're on that course. Uh, I'm the mother of four daughters. Um, all four of them uh, have come through Jackson Street School. My two youngest are twins, sophomores at Northampton High School. And I'm running for city councilor at large because I think this was a great community to grow up in, and it's a great community to raise a family in. But it has some very interesting challenges ahead of it. Uh, right now, we're looking at a new election that's going to bring in new leadership into the corner office. Uh, and that's, that's going to be a big change for us. We know that uh, David or Michael will be holding that office after the first of the year. And I think it's very important that city council will be a strong and independent voice to help them guide the city and keep it robust and vibrant as it has been for the last number of years. It takes a lot of energy to do that. It takes a long history and knowledge of the city. I've, I uh, believe that the, uh, the critical issues in front of us are good financial management, uh, paying attention to our streets and sidewalks, our infrastructure, and making sure that this fine public education system that we've had for a long time stays, stays as vibrant and active and as strong as it is. Thank you. Hello. My name is Bill Dwight. Um, I'm really grateful for tonight's debate. I, I actually I want to thank Ganeda Garcia and Mary Cowie for and Families with Power and Casa Latina for arranging this, and also thank you to Gwen Agna and the Jackson Street School family for providing a, the library and hosting this event. And this is uh, the first time in my memory, for what that's worth, is uh, that there's been an opportunity for this neighborhood to, to learn more about the candidates who were asking to serve this community. And also for, this is the first time I've seen where we've had an opportunity as candidates to learn more about the neighborhood this neighborhood in specific. I served for this area of Ward 1 for eight years. Uh, that was about six years ago. Um, back when the Center for New Americans was based out of Hampshire Heights in the community room. And back when Hathaway Farms was Hampton Gardens. And back 
when the only way you could get to the bike path was a dirt rut road, a little path. And the only way, and, and the only way where Hampshire Heights uh, residents could get to King Street was through a hole cut in the fence. My son went to Jackson Street School, uh, and when Gwen Agner first started, in fact, and uh, now he's 26. And many things have changed, and unfortunately, in some cases, many things have not. I want to remind you that your dreams and your hopes are just as important as valid and as valid as anyone else's in this community. You have the right to insist on safe sidewalks. You have the right to insist on safe streets for your families and children to traverse. You have the right to, you are entitled to the same services as anyone else in this community. Even if you weren't born here, even if you don't vote, it doesn't matter. You're entitled to ask. And I think, I, you know, I was actually quite proud um, the, the three weeks ago when families with, members of Families with Power and residents from Hampshire Heights came to testify before the planning board about and, and let them know what their concerns were relative to this neighborhood. And I hope I'll give you the opportunity that we can talk more about that now that my time is up. Um, my name is Michael Janik, and I was under the assumption that there would be an interpreter for the people that are here that are Spanish. I'm, I'm not sure if anybody needs this to be translated, that that is available to them. But I'll, I'll go ahead and say my uh, my speech, and if you know of anybody that needs okay. that, okay. Um, I would like to thank the Families with Power, Casa Latina, for a chance to be part of the process to improve communication with the Walmart residents. I grew up in Jackson Park, Van Hoyoke, a community just like Hampshire Heights and Florence Heights. My mother was a single parent of three children who, like most residents of Hampshire and Florence communities, were trying to offer the best life for their children and themselves. My mother was an active participant in her community to make it safe and clean, a place to be proud to live in, and I applaud all of you for having the courage to make your community a safe and clean one to live in. It is incumbent upon city government to be invested in these communities, not just at election time, but, uh, but throughout the year. Part of my candidacy has been about citizen input to allow those affected parties to have an equal uh, opportunity to have a voice in the democratic process. As your elected city councilor at large, I will make this promise. I will be available to put your interests and concerns forward throughout the year. Together we can be part of a process to find solutions. Thank you very much. Okay. So, we're going to begin by asking you questions. Now, do you remember the sequence? Um, the first question I think is Arlene. Oh, um, I have it. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Emily. Um, and we're going to keep you on task for time, so don't be offended if we cut, cut you off. In what order are we answering? Do you know? Um, so I think we're just going to go down the row. We could start, we could stagger it if you think that's... We'll that's the way we've been doing it. So okay. First person goes first. So if we'll you want to start the end. Yeah, the the answer. Answer. Okay. <laughs> Got a system? <laughs> go ahead, Arlene. All right. So I'm from Northampton, um, grew up in Hampshire Heights, lived there for 17 years of my life. So I have a two-part question, actually. Um, how would you improve the safety of King Street area for residents who ride bicycles and walk, especially those who push strollers and use wheelchairs? Um, I think our biggest concern is the Pride intersection there. And coming up, um, Bridge Road, there's no sidewalk. So whoever's coming up has to cut through Hampshire Heights which shouldn't have to happen. Um, and again, that access from the Hampshire Heights side over to Pride. Many years ago, we had a kid who got hit by a car, was killed. I lived through that, so it was horror. And we've had kids who the police pick up on the other side of the street and bring them back to parents because there isn't a crosswalk and they're just crossing the street to get to Pride. And then we have students who come to Jackson Street who live in River Run who have no sidewalk access all the way here. So uh, should I say the second part or hold off on it? Um. <laughs> okay, second part. How will you improve the city's ability to get input from the low-income community about development projects? Thank you. So actually, so you started the intro you introduced yourself first, so we'll start with Mary. Uh, Jay. <laughs> Thank you for that question. I think both of those are very important questions. Thank you. 
Um, the first one about the transport, uh, the intersection down there. I think that as the city moves forward and tries to make the King Street corridor much more pedestrian and bike friendly, they have to pay attention to the full range of it. Clearly, we've made a lot of improvements down more towards Stop and Shop and down around the bike path, but that has to spread out, and really, that planning has to be in place. One of the things that I think is critically important is that for the city to do the planning, to get ready to use the, the stimulus money that might come our way. We know that the work that we did out here in front of Jackson Street, we were able to do that because, number one, we had an, a very strong planning process that said we need to slow down traffic out here. We, because of that, we had neighborhood involvement. There was a lot of work that was done. The engineering was done. So when the, the money came along, the stimulus money came along, boom, we were shovel ready. We were ready to go there. I say that we got to do the same thing up at King Street. That King Street intersection and that stretch from Pride down to River Run, it scares the dickens out of me every time I see people walking there. And I think that right now we really need to make that a priority, especially as we connect it to the more retail and the rest of the King Street corridor. So I would, I would actually push, and I will push, the Board of Public Works to really take that intersection, that stretch from King Street to River Run, and look at what we can do about getting that planning done. Now, I know you set, asked a second question. Ah, oh, input from lower uh, income community. You know, I think there needs to be a lot more grassroots efforts to be out there to walk around, to make ourselves known. To I think that the Jackson Street um, Farmer's Market was a, a home run because we went down there and bought some great produce, and it was a great informal opportunity to be down there. And for the community to get to connect more significantly with our low-income populations who are, who are frequently isolated in you know, residential projects. And I have 30 seconds left. So I would say it's incumbent on us to reach out, that we've got to, the people who want to hear and involve and engage the low-income community need to. I'll share with you that in my experience working for Habitat for Humanity, I'm frequently out there working with a number of folks who, who have that American dream and want to think about becoming a Habitat homeowner. So I'm used to and comfortable and know a number of of folks who, who live in it, who are in the low-income community. Yes, and my time is up. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say, since those are two long questions, why don't we just break it up and first have people respond to the first question about the intersection, and then after everybody responds to that, then respond to Arlene's second question about more involvement. And you could just have another minute if you want to <laughs> breathlessly add anything, because it is too much in two minutes. Okay, sorry. My bottom line is, is that I think it's, it's incumbent on people in leadership to find ways to make, make themselves known and to be known and to engage with the low-income community. And I already have great familiarity with low-income population and families who live here, and, but continue committed to, to continue that engagement, that there are issues that are facing the low-income communities in Northampton that we find out about the wrong way, and we should know about it before it's on the in the paper or or there's a terrible tragedy because of a result of something that we have failed to do as leaders. Now my time's up. The uh, the event that Anita was talking about and in inviting people to come, that's the council meeting tomorrow night to go testify along that line. The Northampton is in a stage right now, near the end stages, unfortunately, of... Uh, of um, zoning change for King Street and they and some of it's pretty good and part of my frustration throughout that process that I spoke to early on the process even before I even considered running for council and also that I spoke to when I was in the council when they talked about it years and years ago was the fact that we're creating a corridor down King Street and it's just that it's a hallway with no doors it's easier it will be easier for people to drive from Brattleboro to shop here than it will be for people who live a hundred yards away to get to and that's wrong because where we are right now is some of the densest population concentrations in the whole city. And we have not been responsive, adequately responsive, to the needs of the particular safety concerns. If we're offering to build stores on King Street, we damn well better offer the opportunity to get there alive for everybody. I think that's reasonable. And I think the, the it's, it's been part of, and, and the thing is, is this is actually an aspect of neglect. It's not malignant neglect. It wasn't born, it wasn't done by bad people doing bad things. The problem was, which will speak to your second part of your question that I'll get to when I get there, but, <laughs> but it's, it's access, it's first of all, people in this community and neighborhood knowing that they have, as I said in my opening statement, they have every right to insist on these safety features. Every neighborhood does. You heard the mayoral candidates talk about it. Every community talks about these things, except 
For this neighborhood, not always enough because they've never felt properly engaged or invested or even that they had a chance in asking. I insist that you have the right to insist, and I will do as counselor as I did as counselor, work for those same issues. And then we're answering the second part of the question later or yes. later? Got it. I'll hold on to it. Um, I think there's already a process in, in place. We've already started it. We're, we're restructuring King Street into three zones. I think what the important part is that you have two uh, entities right now that should be included in the process through the whole part, and that's the Families with Power and uh, Casa Latina. They're your representatives here, and they should be included in the whole uh, process with the city entities. Um, we, we, uh, you have the meeting tomorrow night, and you will be speaking there. I think as a community, I would like to see a lot of people go there. Uh, it, it's your right to uh, be involved. Uh, it's, your, it's the city's, uh, it's incumbent upon the city to listen to you, to listen to your concerns. Your access to get across King Street should be the main priority. Uh, I, I believe that's what, you, what you're looking for, is to have um, a fair, equitable, and safe uh, process to go across the streets. Um, as a community, uh, I think, uh, and, and Bill pointed to it, that you've been left out of the process, and you're just now getting into it, and they're just now listening to you. So it's incumbent upon the city to take the lead role now, to, to come to you, not you to keep going to them, to, uh, to uh, be in part of this process. And I think that's the missing piece here. And I, I certainly, as your counselor at large, I would be uh, proactive in coming down and talking to you and, and helping you through that process. Arlene, I, I, when I was growing up, I spent a lot of time in Hampshire Heights. A lot of my friends live there, as well as, as Damon Road on uh, River Run, as you know. And, and I know firsthand how, how dangerous it is, well, coming from Hampshire Heights, going across the street to, the, to um, the convenience store and the gas station, or if you're walking from um, River Run towards, towards, the, towards the intersection, going to DeAngelo's, it is extremely dangerous. And what there needs to be is a light with that, with, that allows for pedestrians to cross, um, and there needs to be sidewalks. And, and I envision in the future um, a more travelable, walkable city that, that is safe um, to travel. And, and this part of town needs more access both to King Street and downtown. Um, in my experience, I was the chair of the Board of Public Works and City Council Conference Committee in this first term, and that allowed me to familiarize myself with the infrastructure part of that. And I was also vice chair of the Parking and Transportation Commission, which allowed us, me to look at the, the transportation issues, um, the road issues, and, and travelability. Um, and what needs to happen is we need the, the, the process uh, needs to be inclusive, but the one thing I would like to see hastened is the funding on the state level. And I know the state rep is on board with that. So as your counselor at large, uh, when I get reelected, if I do, I would like to advocate for those projects to happen. So, and now I'm doing the second part? Okay. Actually, to that question, I've actually already been working on that, working on that, again, also before I was running for council or even before I was considering running for council. I had considered, I was running for council when I met with Families with Power um, here at the school up there at the hall. And made, it, because my frustration was I had gone to the planning board, not the planning board meeting, the meeting where they were making the proposal, and I said, I was concerned that they, no one had been heard from from this community yet. And the fact is, I, I also insist that you can't proceed as if not hearing from anybody means that there's nothing to worry about. So I went to Families with Power and asked people to consider coming in, coming downtown and, and bravely actually speaking before a city committee. I mean, I think that takes a certain amount of courage. I think if, if I were to become counselor, I think for outreach on issues like that, meetings here in this school, which is a community center for the most part, it's where everyone can walk to safely as opposed to trying to get down without sidewalks to, to bridge uh, to down Bridge Road or, or to anywhere down there, provide an opportunity to meet. And when we did have the meeting, we, we invited uh, Carolyn Mish from the planning office to come meet with families of plow, power over the community room. That's not a one-timer. That's not just for today. That's not just for this week. It's not even for this issue. It's to have department heads and people who are associated with the bigger decisions of the city come here to make to have the conversation. 
to hear about people's concerns. And, and then the responsibility is borne by the people in the community to come and make that expression and to make their claim and to insist on what it is that they want and what their concerns are. When the, when the boy was killed in the Surview parking lot, it's interesting, we frequently have debates about traffic in the city and someone always invokes, someday a child's going to get killed. Actually, a child did get killed, and there was very little that happened as a result of that. Yes. And speaking to the second part of your, your question, I, I lived in the projects in, in Hoyoke, and the traffic was right across the street from Hoyoke High School. And uh, my mother was active in getting a crossing guard, so what I applaud you for is starting the process. I think it's incumbent upon the government now to come to you. Uh, you've already started the process, and as your counselor at large, I would be out there promoting uh, your concerns. I would be trying to have meetings with you uh, as much as possible, and as, as um, uh, Bill said, including department heads, and uh, what can we do to solve the problems that you have? Um, some of the stuff uh, that was uh, talked about was um, access here across, and we saw what what happened, uh, the state got the funding, put in the, uh, the uh, humps out there, and that uh, did some traffic calming. So again, I applaud you for starting the process. I think it's incumbent upon us now to, to meet you. Um, with respect to receiving more citizen input, I think that's, that's certainly one of the jobs of a, of a city councilor at large. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have been at the Ordinance and Planning Board meeting where I first saw Families of Power come out and express some of their concerns, and that was extremely valuable. For me, public service is, is about giving voice to others and, uh, and being a voice for people, sometimes people who don't have as much of a voice. And <clears throat> my first time I've been an accessible counselor, as a counselor, I fought for governmental transparency, and that's important, but it's not always enough. Um, the government has to be not only transparent, but accessible and not always all the time expect people with concerns to come to them but also reach out and that's what I'll do if reelected I'll continue to reach out to other people okay. so the next question will be from um, Maria hi my name is Maria I'm a former member of Casa Latina and founder of Family with Power One uh, many members of Casa Latina and Hispanic community suffer from diabetes and other health problems. What would you do to, uh, to, get, uh, to get more healthy store, healthy food that are accessible to families or low income and more physical activity that actually a family can afford to pay for it or pay half of that? Mm -hmm. I, I had two kids here in the school in a they want to play sports in the school, but it's expensive. That's me? Yes. Thank you. Actually, where I first met you, Maria, was at, uh, was at the farm, yep. at, the, at, at the farmer's market at, at Jackson Street, um, which was actually an inspiration from the, the uh, I believe that was Families with Power, working with uh, the city and working with Ben James of Town Farm. And it was... It was rather astonishing to see how many people were essentially people were congregating in a spot in a community that they've lived in and meeting people that they lived with for the first time in a long time and talking with people and having access to good healthy local grown food and food stamps matched one dollar for two so for every dollar value on the food stamp that was bought two dollars worth of, uh, of of produce it was it was matched by the um, by the, the the grant that was applied. From what I understand, I talked to Ben James yesterday about this, and it doesn't look like there was the revenue to try and do that more frequently, which would be great. There's the grocery stores that are accessible for people who don't have cars, don't offer a lot of variety in that respect. It's certainly an affordable variety of good, healthy food. Um, and then what happens consequently, as you said, the rate of diabetes is much more increased, much higher in this demographic simply because what's available is lousy food. It's food that's it's processed and, and high in sugars. Working in the council, the thing is that we don't, we're not kings. If we get to be councilors, we don't get to wave our wand and make things right. But we can facilitate and work towards uh, reaching out to community organizations to promote these things. 
the sports athletic fee is a different issue. And and and, and you know, beyond trying to make I think the bike path more accessible, making it easier to walk to places by placing sidewalks, walking to school, and things such as like that, and plowing the snow, uh, plowing the bike path for kids to go to school. But the the school athletic fees are are, are a different trick altogether, and it's how we we're going to have to figure out what our priorities are in the school and what's how they're going to be best applied ultimately. That's not an answer. It's it's as much a question as anything else. Um. And I think Bill spoke about the, the fees for the athletic fees. But there is something that we can do as a community through the school. And, and our principal at Ryan Road did, she started a walking club and, and to try and engage the kids and, and some of the parents to walk to school from Florence Heights area. So she, she's already started that. Um, what I did was I um, uh, saw that at Halloween and Valentine's that kids were bringing in candy. And what I asked uh, was that we look for healthy options, and that was to bring fruits and, and, and things that were, uh, were high in sugar. And what we did was we sent that home in our, our newsletter, The Bear Facts, and we asked the uh, uh, parents that for the next holiday to uh, uh, be cognizant of the fact of, of the sugar content and, and our, the uh, kids uh, being more active and uh, uh, removing that sugar from, from the snacks because they're geared in their head that they're going to get candy at Halloween, they're going to get candy at Valentine's Day, and get candy at birthdays and things like that. So what we did was we looked for healthy options, um, bringing in uh, fruits and uh, vegetables and things like that, and educating the kids about what's good about those those items. So um, as as your counselor at large, I would work more with the schools and try and do some kind of an educational outreach type thing, um, because I believe that's a good aspect because we, we can educate our kids to do more healthful options. And what that does is they take it home to their parents. And they tell their parents, hey, mom, I'd like, to, like you to lose some weight. Dad, I think you need to lose some weight. Um, and they start talking about um, access to these good foods. And I think that becomes part of the family aspect. I think, I think uh, having healthy foods available to, to everyone in the community is, is, a, is a public health issue in general. And I support farmers markets. Um, this, this session, the council had the opportunity to buy the bean and aller farms. And I voted for that. I was an enthusiastic supporter and contributed to the purchase privately. And one of the things we're doing with that land is where it's going to be used for local foods, um, for local agriculture, for locally grown food. And one of the things that I've seen and is uh, one of the things I support is, is introducing more healthy foods in schools. I think programs like Fresh Wednesdays are, are a great success, and I think we need to expand on that. In fact, one of the things I've done because part of my platform is healthier foods in schools, is I've already contacted the superintendent and people from Grow Food Northampton, and I'd like to form a sort of coalition, um, figuring out how we can have healthier foods in schools on a more regular basis. Um, <clears throat> what I can do as counselor at large, I can also help people access programs that are available to them. And um, <clears throat> another thing I think that we need to do is, and I've done as a, in my first term, is we need to advocate to other levels of government um, to spend in a manner that's more appropriate and, for example, ending wars so that we can bring money home here. That way we can focus on local public health issues. Um, I've advocated for changes on other levels that, that, that <clears throat> when government on other levels make decisions that affect my constituents here at home, I've advocated for them to uh, make the right decisions. And I think that advocating to other levels of government to change their spending so that we have more at home will allow us to have more resources to deal with things like lack of healthy foods for our, uh, citizens in our community and <clears throat> healthy foods in general. I think that the, uh, the local food, the Grow, uh, grow Local Food uh, movement is really strong here in the Valley and it's one that's really come to roost in our, our school food programs. It's been great to see uh, school lunches really doing the, the, the fresh Wednesdays and the local Wednesdays and starting to incorporate more locally grown food into the, the uh, offerings that they have at school lunches. And I think that that's tied to a, a increasing awareness of folks in the valley that, you know, much like we, we use energy from outside of the region and it, it causes it dollars to drive out of our, our uh, pockets in the region, the same thing happens with food. When we buy food that gets shipped here from California or from 
South America, those dollars leave here. And what that does is it undermines our local agricultural economy. So as much as we can, looking to bring local food back onto our tables, as we used to know, to start, eat, start eating seasonally and for kids to get the, the sense that, you know, there's a reason that you get pumpkins in October and apples in, you know, apples in the fall, and that you eat seasonally and start coming to appreciate the seasonality of food and make it part of the interesting food culture that we have. I think it's incredibly important that as much as possible we get the local food that's grown here into our hands, onto our tables, and we're doing a great job with the, the uh, farmers markets, which, you know, obviously create um, that opportunity much more readily than the, the supermarkets might. And then the other part that you were talking about, Maria, was the, the whole sports program and how incredibly important it is to help kids be active, to get that day-to-day -day exercise where they're walking around, where they're getting out of cars. And that means we as parents have to help them find ways to do that, clearly safely, but that uh, when it's too easy to s offer them a ride to school to make sure they get out there on time, it's time for us to start thinking about, you know, giving them a little kick in the butt and say get up a little earlier and walk or get on your bike because there are many opportunities to do those small lifestyle changes between what you're eating and how you're moving around as a person that can over the long haul really empower yourself to have a much healthier future. Okay, so okay, you're going to ask us the last question and I believe you'll be answering. Okay. Good evening, Roque Sanchez, Northampton resident. Uh, to live in Northampton uh, and to have a healthy environment and, and buy nice and healthy food, everybody, the citizen, the resident, needs some living wage. Uh, almost two years ago, the city council passed the living wage resolution. What have you done and what would you do to support living wage for workers in Northampton? I guess that's me. Um, I, I haven't said in the council, uh, but um, um, I, I really can't answer that because I, I haven't haven't done, had a chance to do anything like that. But uh, uh, speaking for myself, uh, um, I have to really think about this. Uh, I would support any initiative. I think we've done very good as a community uh, as far as uh, passing the living wage. Um, for my, myself, I, I would have to say. It's just uh, going out there and um, talking to people and uh, as a government official uh, pushing a, a, a community to be more cognizant of the fact of a living wage, of what the costs are, and um, um, trying to promote the, uh, the restaurants in the downtown area to do uh, living wage, to hire people um, to uh, have a living wage. Other than that, I, I haven't been at that active on that. I've supported the Living Wage Coalition both uh, before I was a counselor and as a counselor. And I think paying workers a living wage is extremely important. It's one of my values, and I believe in workers' rights as well. Um, I'm a business owner. I have an employee, and I pay that employee a living wage. And she's present in this room. If you don't believe me, you can ask her. <laughs> but but I, I think it's extremely important, and I've been a supporter of the Living Wage Coalition, and if you elect me, I'll continue to do so. I think the living wage uh, discussion is a very important one to keep on the forefront. And I think that here in Northampton we can pass a resolution at City Council that says we support it and we'll, we'll live by it. But I think that there are broader economic issues that are at play in the nation and in the region. This area used to have a very strong manufacturing backbone that has eroded over time. People were able to work in manufacturing to make a, make a good wage, buy a decent, modest little home, be able to stay here, and to plan for their retirement, to send their kids to community colleges. It wasn't a big stress, but what we see nationally is really that the middle class has eroded. If you look at everything in terms of how income has shifted to the, the upper end of the income, and most of us are the 99% left behind who are trying to make ends meet, meet our basic human needs. But where it comes to bear here in the valley is right now we're looking at an economy uh, that is really bifurcated. We've got people who work at the very low income of the income spectrum doing retail, which is an incredibly important part of our local economy. And then we have a higher end, so we really have this, this sort of split and the middle is missing. So I, I think that the important thing is with this erosion of the middle class that we really have to make sure that, the, that we are doing everything that we can to make sure that people lo earning at the lower end of the income spectrum can meet their basic human needs, their shelter, their food, 
basic health care. And where it means is that it needs to be at that ta that discussion needs to be on the table. And putting it into our contracts keeps it on the table. So I'm very supportive of that. The, <clears throat> this is the second living wage resolution the council passed. I actually passed the first one with one of the sponsors and advocates of the original one. Unfortunately, it's a resolution. And a resolution is not a law. A resolution is saying this is what our intent is. And we charge the city that they would, um, they had to prioritize vendors who paid a living wage. So it'll be if you bought your paper, it was supposed to be from a company that provided a living wage. And the, and the resolution, the second resolution is very similar to that. And it, it's not a law. And a living wage, the concept of a living wage is, it's kind of frustrating. It's, it's actually paying the amount of money to live within a community and sustain life. That's it. It's not to enjoy life and not to grow and not to expand and not to nurture. It's just to stay alive. And when I first voted for the resolution, this, the living wage was $7.12 an hour was what was proposed. I worked at a job as a retailer downtown recent, until July, and then it just closed. I worked there for 25 years and was paid a living wage by very conscientious employers. And as a result, all the people who worked at this video store, I was senior, I was there for 25 years. The, next, the, the newest member who worked there had been there for eight years. You sustain employees. You keep a devotion and a commitment to the, to the business and the enterprise. Unfortunately, a lot of business owners are, are challenged for a variety of reasons because of the economy, and they make expedient choices. Pay cheap, turn o high turnover employees, kind of a low response, low give back, and those businesses fade away sometimes. What we have to do is nurture that and continue to nurture that here in this community, the concept that paying a living wage isn't only a moral obligation, it's the best thing for the community. And we, and unfortunately, what we're left with are resolutions, not laws. Okay. So we're going to ask. Um, Mary has people written. <coughs> we have. We'll see how much time we have, but we'll start with the first one question. Jasper is the first question. Okay, Jasper, it sounds like you have the first question. Hopefully we'll have time for a second question, but let's go ahead and get yours. Okay, so I live in Ward 3 uh, in, a, in an apartment building, and there's, there's six apartments. I often volunteer to help my landlord shovel the snow off the sidewalk, and the reason I'm asking this question is because last winter I had to do it a bunch of times when... I would shovel the sidewalk. I would often be shoveling two things, snow and ice, which is normal, and dog poo, which is not. If you're elected, what specific actions will you take to help address this problem? <laughs> <laughs> it's not legal. Well, we're, right, right. Jasper, it's a good question. The fact of the matter is there is a law on the books preventing that on public property, and so um, it is a matter of enforcement. And what we need to do is, is you know, it's hard to catch a dog in the act of doing that if you're, if you're law enforcement. But you should, I mean, if, you can, if an owner is being irresponsible, you should relay that to, to law enforcement. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's really what needs to be done in that situation. I would encourage you to. You're not, you're not, you're not um, wasting their time. It's not a small matter. It is a law. It's on the books. And if you see that happening, you should call law enforcement. I encourage you to do that. And um, I would encourage, if re-elected, law enforcement to to uh, to pay attention to that issue. I do serve in the public safety committee th this term, and I um, and I'm glad to tell you know tell the chief that it is an ongoing problem, and talk to him about how we can work on more enforcement on that. So, uh, could you could you let us know uh, where we should call if sure. we have that situation? Sure. Just you call the just the regular non-emergency police number. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. I think what you're speaking to is something that you know people shouldn't be doing or dogs shouldn't be doing or people who have dogs shouldn't be leaving behind for you to take care of. And the question always is, what happened? what's the first way to approach something like that? I think, first of all, the community needs to be educated. Most people do know that they need to pick up after their dog. I know sometimes people forget to bring bags, and I have, on occasion, 
pulled a bag out of my pocket and handed it to a, a dog owner who, um, whose dog um, left something unexpected behind. Uh, but I think that the point is, is that there needs to be that ongoing education. Yes, if it's somebody who's doing it all the time, I, you know, clearly you report it. But I think there has to be this sort of community respect and care that it's the norm that you pick up after your dog in the neighborhood. And after that, then it's everybody sort of enforcing it on each other. Jasper, I think the most important aspect of that question is the fact that you're shoveling your walk the full width right after a storm. And you know why? I mean, actually, that's a law, too. That's required. And you don't own the sidewalk. The city owns the sidewalk. But it's one of the things that we ask, it's speaking to what MJ was saying, that there is, and in speaking with this gentleman said, there's an aspect of personal responsibility where we are obliged as community members to maintain the sidewalk. And that's stop your dogs from leaving what dogs leave on sidewalks. But actually, even more importantly, I do think actually critically more importantly, I mean, that's an, a nuisance annoying and it's gross. Snow, leaving snow on a sidewalk, is actually an impediment to anyone with a child in a stroller, anyone in a wheelchair, on, on crutches, and people walking side by side or walking past each other. It's a safety feature for car, it's to keep the snow banks down so cars can pull out of their driveways without hitting pedestrians. It's, it's actually, the, it, it put, we run the highest rate of accidents related directly to lack of shoveling when people are forced to walk out on the street and the streets are already narrow. It's a pain. The snow, where I live, there is no green strip, so the snow bank is my sidewalk that I have to lift up over and put into my yard, and then the snow plow comes by again, and then you start it all over again. And, and, it's, and we all have special names that we call plowmen when they do that. But the thing is, and it's sometimes it's the same thing that's left on the sidewalk. And they, but the, the thing is that, that what's more important is that you did that. You abided by that and obeyed the law. Um, <laughs> I'll use uh, Bill's one of the things. If I were king, I would have a educational program and uh, trash cans and bags available for the dog owners. I own two dogs. I, I'm a respectable owner. Um, I, I, I think there, uh, if I were king again, I would have a doggy park. But that's not, not the, the uh, thing here at issue. Is that I think education. Uh, uh, um, I think. Uh, by doing the right thing, we would educate the people and say, look at, you know, there is a leash law, there is a, is a poop law. Um, it needs to be cleaned up. Uh, I, I don't know if you contacted this person, if you saw them, or if it's just one of those things where you just saw them on the ground and decided to take care of it. But uh, um, there might be something taken into uh, media to help them remember, remind her that there's a leash law uh, and there's a poop law. Uh, it can be done at the clerk's office when those people have to register dogs, because all dogs have to be registered. So. Um, it may be able to come through the clerk's office that they're handed the paper, give them the information that, that you must pick up after your dog. So uh, those are some of the things that we can immediately do. Um, I, I applaud you for doing what you did. Um, as Bill pointed out, you did clear the sidewalk, and um, I, I hope that, that we can, uh, as a community, be a little more cognizant of the fact of what our animals are doing and be more respectful to our neighbors. So I think we have time for one more question if we keep it to one minute each. Um, okay. Okay. We'll run through this one and then do some closing. Um, Northampton Media reported the other day that up to one-third of Northampton's water supply now belongs to Coca-Cola by contract. How did this happen? This is from Sue. Who's first? Oh, I'm sorry. MJ. 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 Um, I would like to check that fact before I make a comment on it. So mm -hmm. I'll just pass on that question. Okay. Um, and I don't know about the fact either as it is, but let's let's accept it as fact for now. And and, and what was negotiated with Coca-Cola was a number of things: it was a, a tip, a tax incentive, essentially, to um, expand their worker base. At the same time, to ironically create things like Dasani water, which people buy as water, which is our city water, <laughs> processed through reverse osmosis that you. You end up paying more for the bottle than the water ultimately, but the fact is, is that Coca-Cola is a large employer, and part of the part of the agreement that was negotiated, um, and I wasn't a participant, in, and and I'm not sure how I even feel about it, but was a negotiation for water usage. 
and, and, and that includes a certain amount of water usage. And again, I can speak to the numbers, so, but that came to be simply, I think, for the most part, to uh, promote and establish a, a living wage employer in, in the city of Northampton and to retain a living wage employer that's been here historically. But, you know, I could be full of what Jasper finds on the sidewalk, and if it turns out I'm not right. <coughs> Uh, could you just restate the question? I just um, want to make sure. Northampton no. Media reported um, that one third of Northampton's water supply now belongs to Coca-Cola by contract. How did this happen? Um, I, I don't know if the, the figure's right, but I, it, it's it's concerning. One third. That, I mean, it's two thirds left for the city. Um, the, we can renegotiate, I believe, uh, down the road. We can ask Coke for s some things. Uh, to be put in place. Uh, I, I think one of the things is uh, some contingency plans. If our water levels drop below a, a certain level, um, uh, there there are some concerns that you know we're the bigger taxpayer here. Even though Coke has one third of the use, we're the bigger taxpayer as the homeowners. And I think that we have to be con taken in consideration. Um, I don't know if we can go back to the table, but that's something certainly that we can look at. Is as uh, uh, requesting that the mayor look at this. I'm not, I'm not sure all the specifics can be done. But uh, again, it's, it's citizen outreach. If, if we can contact our counselors and then that we can put this forward, uh, I think that would work. Right, I'll, I'll make it brief. Uh, the Coke doesn't own our water. They use our water. They pay, they pay, oh, uh, they use a tremendous amount. Maybe that's where the confusion lies. I don't know. But they pay a water, um, a water fee, just the, the, the BBW sets a water and sewer rate, and they pay that rate. We did give them a, a tax break on part of the new construction of their new facility, the new part, um, for a limited period of time. And for me, generally, it's counterintuitive to give a company like Coke a tax break. I support it because it's only on the new growth of the building and for a short period of time, and it resulted in 100 new jobs, or a number around 100. And so I did support that. And, um, and so for those reasons, because the expansion created about 100 new jobs, and the tax break they received is for a limited period of time on part of the building. Um, and I guess there's a burning question, so that we're going to... Bill, you're, you're the first one to go, and you've got okay. a minute. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. My name's Susco, Steve Susco, 754 Bridge Road, just up the street here. Uh, over the last almost 20 years, there's been a, uh, a problem in this neighborhood which has affected all of us, or threatened all of us, whether you know it or not, and that was our sewer system. Two years ago, it culminated in multiple backups into my home. Uh, what I'd like to ask the four candidates, in it, all in different ways because they all would have different involvements or opinions, is first of all, Mr. Dwight, you were the counselor when the problem initially developed. Why wouldn't you heed the calls for help? Mr. Adams, two years ago, you stood in my driveway and said you would make some changes based on the extensive information I gave you, and you did nothing. Uh, Ms. Poulin, you're on the DPW. Uh, a week ago, I offered the DPW my uh, suggestions on, on changes we could make in our procedures and how we uh, identify these problems and deal with them, and uh, I was removed from the agenda with no reason. And for the other candidate, uh, can you bring us something different, sir? Thank you. Well, Mr. Susco, um, 20 years ago, I wasn't on the council, but that's okay. I was your counselor, and in fact, actually, as I recall, I responded to more calls from you than any other constituent. But the issue about the storm drain, the storm drain system, not only on Bridge Road, but throughout the entire city, the storm drain system, of course, for a lot of people, actually, I would argue that it was worse for the people in Barrett Street who were living in Coach Light apartments who had raw sewage coming up in their apartments, in their bathrooms, and uh, repeatedly because of lenient 70s, 1970s regulation about how pipes and drainage would work. I'm sorry and, you haven't made oh, wait, no, I'm sorry, but well, we can't I'm, have, I'm, you know, we, we, we have like four minutes left of our uh, I've only got a few seconds left. Yeah. The fact is, is you're absolutely right. In, to the extent that what has been done has been done slowly. 
it's not been done in the speed with which we would all like to see, particularly the people, as I said, in the coastline apartments who have to deal with raw sewage in their, in their bathtubs and in their kitchens. We, I'm sorry, is that, that it? Time. That was yeah. my time? Yeah. Okay. Um, again, this is, is a, I think, a process problem. Um, the DPW probably should have had some kind of system in place to answer your, your uh, calls, not just your counselor, but you should have been, had um, access to the DPW. It, it's, it was the DPW's problem. They should have been right on that scene and doing things. And, and uh, as your counselor, I would have been standing right beside you at the uh, DPW and, and asking them what is going on. Because obviously, at Barrett Street, he, he's just pointed out, so it's not just one problem. There, there's some kind of problem going on, and we need to get to the bottom of it. And as your counselor at large, I would work on getting answers for you. It, it, sometimes it may not be the ones you want, but I think that the onus um, is on the city council at large to be your advocate, no matter what, whether they agree with you or not, is to, to be involved in the process and um, being at that DPW and finding the, trying to find the answers for why there was raw sewage in your place and also on Barrett Street. That's time. Steve, two years ago when I was at your house, I told you I would be your advocate, and I've done that, and I'll continue to do that. I've answered all your calls, and we've had several phone conversations, um, lengthy ones, and I appreciate all of them, and I appreciate both site visits at your house. And if and, and you're shaking your head no, so I don't think I'm invited anymore, but if, you, if, you, if you'd like to discuss further, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to take your, continue to take your calls. I haven't heard from you in a while. I'll, I'll give you a call if you like, and I, I promise to be accessible. If you want me to, I'll call you tomorrow. But the thing is, Steve, you know, I mean, I, I wish that it, it was uh, I could have solved that issue in, in, in my first term. Clearly, it's a bigger issue than I, than one counselor can solve in one term. I still will advocate for you. I'd also like to know how um, the nursing home leaving is going to affect your situation because I know you had some issues with the nursing home. So I really would like to hear more about your issues, Steve, and I would encourage you to call me. And if I don't hear from you, I'm going to call you tomorrow afternoon. I tried to okay, call sorry. you. I'm I'm sorry. 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 I do sit on the Board of Public Works. I know, Mr. Sesco, that you've been with our Clams Committee several times. I do know that you were, there was some discussion about you being on the agenda this last Wednesday night. My understanding is that you called him and asked to be removed from the agenda. My understanding is, is that the Board of Public Works is ready to continue to try to deal with that issue, the sewage issue, down around your property. And we know it's been an ongoing thing, but I think it speaks to the long-term difficulty we've had with infrastructure problems and certain pockets of the air of the city have much more trouble than others and that we do our best we try to respond we try to when things don't go well you end up in front of claims committee I do know that there were some issues with the property that was adjacent to yours uh, but I believe that was cleared up uh, the facility is now closed but like I said yeah, the Board of Public Works is there and like I said I expect you're on the next agenda because you requested to be removed from the last one so we, we entertained that last question at a special request, you know, so we, we really want to keep moving and you all have one minute for your closing sure. remarks um, and we're starting with, um, yes. Oh, you're starting with me? Okay. Thank you again to Families with Power and Casa Latina for putting on this forum. Throughout my life I have chosen jobs that have been service orientated. I honorably served in the U.S. Navy and worked in the food industry for 20 years, mostly in management. 15 years with Big Y in Northampton where I was trusted to manage a multi-million dollar store. I currently work as a paraprofessional in the Hampshire Regional School District in Southampton working with children that need just a little help getting their education, uh, educational needs met. I by no means am working in the education field for financial reward, mm -hmm. but for a willingness, like so many other educators, to impact a child's life. Educationally, I graduated honors from UMass uh, with a concentration in American government, and I'm uh, pursuing a psychological studies uh, for a master's from Cambridge College uh, due to graduate in January. In the past, I was fortunate to work for Congressman Conti, where I, I worked on veterans issue and I saw a true representation uh, was done. I believe my past education and my history speak to my abilities to be your counselor at large. I'm committed to the job, if elected, and on November 8th, I hope to get your vote. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank all the sponsors and all of you for participating in your democracy. I have a vision for the future of Northampton, and in my next term, I'd like to address these important issues along with others. Drafting and adopting a new charter that will facilitate a more transparent, balanced, and effective government. Addressing our air infrastructure, including our roads, public buildings, and sewers. And continued advocacy for more school funding to maintain quality public education. Those are some of the things 
I'd like to do if you re-elect me, and I have a proven track record of delivering on my, on my promises. Public service is very important. It's a lot of work. And I'd like to thank Bill, MJ, and Mike for this discussion, all the discussions we've had. It's probably the last time we'll see each other in, in, uh, all together until we find out the results of election. I really want to thank all of you. Um, <clears throat> we'll have a new mayor this year, and I'd like to be re-elected as the experienced at-large candidate along with a new one. It's been an honor to serve, and I'd like to be re-elected, so I'd like to ask every one of you for one of your votes for Councilor at Large next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to thank Castle Latina and, and Families with Power to, for sponsoring this forum tonight. It's been a real delight to be City Councilor at Large candidate. Uh, I've learned a lot in the last couple of weeks um, working with these three guys and talking about what the future of the city is going to look like. And I do think we're looking at a very important change. We're going to, we've already seen Claire leave the corner office. We're going to have someone new there. We're going to have some new voice, a new voice there. And I think it's critically important that the city councilor, city council step up and really help provide guidance and support so that the city continues on its great positive approach that it's been over the last couple of years. We have a vibrant city, a city that is the, the, you know, the envy of everybody in the region. And to keep, that, keep doing that, we've got to do a couple things. We've got to keep our financial house in order. We have to make sure that we're spending our taxes well, collecting our taxes well, and doing the right things with the taxes that we do collect. We need to make sure that we're planning for the future and planning for the future such that when we have opportunities for other revenue to come in from the stimulus money, that we've done the planning. We've done the so that we're ready to sort of hit the road running when funds do become available. And the third piece is that we really need to continue this this process of a great, vibrant future, engaging the citizenry and making it a, a home, a city, a place for everybody to call home. You know, every day. Oops, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm actually, I'm very excited about this, as I said before. I'm really excited at the fact that this debate is occurring here about these issues. And actually, the format was great because it actually, we brought up local issues of, local, uh, of this neighborhood. And I represented this neighborhood once before. The problems that you're experiencing are not unique necessarily to this, to this community, although you, there are certain challenges. We're, we're sitting in, we're, looking at the national government and saying, what the hell is going on there? There's this great dysfunction. What's happened is politicking supplanted governance, and people stopped governing and started just lobbying for positions and circumstances. And what happened was the whole sense, the whole concept of working together and empowering people and uniting people, as opposed to, you know, taking advantage of divisions and schisms. And what we have is a dysfunctional government on the national level. We can't let that happen here. I'm not going to let that happen here. I'm not going to let that happen here whether I get elected or not. I will not stand for that. I stand for mediation, facilitating discussions and unity within a community because the emphasis part is on the word community. We all gather together for a special reason. We gather together. We could all live in isolation, but we choose to live in this town. And we will all work together, and I will do that with you to make this town better. On November 8th, I'd appreciate your vote. Thank you. All the lights are out. The automatic lights. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, thank you for timekeeping, Elba. <laughs>